Good evening again, Canada. Welcome to week three of the Investor's Guide to Thriving for spring 2021. This week, we're going to be focusing on asset allocation strategy, not to be confused with asset location strategy, such as stashing a villa in the south of France like Bill Morneau. Many of you have probably heard that asset allocation is pretty much the entire ballgame when it comes to attributing portfolio returns, but it is easier said than done well. Tonight, we'll hear from BMO ETFs about some of the latest ETF innovations for smart and cost-effective asset allocation. And of course, we'll hear from Larry about the case for emerging markets and what ETFs you can use to stash cash in exotic destinations. Indeed, it's not always easy to do these things on your own, and that's where ETF Capital Management, the portfolio management firm Larry and I founded back in 2006, comes in. Our specialty is using option strategies to help investors participate in the upside of today's expensive markets while also protecting downside risk. You can learn more about our private wealth services at etfcm.com. Investor's Guide to Thriving comes to you at no cost in support of childhood leukemia research at SickKids and Alzheimer's and dementia research at the Baycrest Foundation. Larry and I would like to thank those of you who have already made donations. And if you'd still like to make a donation, please use the links in the survey you'll receive after the event this evening. That's how we're able to track and match all of your generosity. And that survey is also your gateway to access the webinar replay. It's gonna arrive in your email tomorrow morning. Tell us how we did and you'll get a link to access all of the above and submit questions for next week. Of course, with all the proceeds going to charity, our generous event sponsors are absolutely key. And so a big thank you goes out to our excellent partners at BMO ETFs. They've been our partners in ETF education since 2009. Well, as promised folks, BMO ETFs is going to share some insights about smart asset allocation with ETFs to help you enhance your portfolio. And speaking of peak performance, it's my pleasure to introduce a man with a panoramic perspective on the subject. Live from the Calgary Rockies, here's director of BMO ETFs, Rob Buller. Awesome, thanks very much, Jared, for including us today. Uh, we took part in a number of these episodes leading into the holiday season, so it's great to kick off the spring season again in the last few weeks. Uh, with regards to today's topic, we're gonna be looking at asset allocation. Now, asset allocation, the concept's not new, but what I think is important is that we reinforce why asset allocation and a well-constructed portfolio is important to investors and how they might want to think about it. From the slide you'll see here, uh, just the concept overall in terms of headline news, whether it's referenced on the media or BNN that you might be watching or you're reading newspapers in the business section, that they're talking about how to construct a portfolio and the word asset allocation comes into this conversation very regularly. The idea in terms of an overarching thought process is how do you blend the portfolio to optimize the risk profile that you're comfortable with as well as reach that total return experience that you're looking for. So what we've ended up, I think, finding is that this is an older concept, yet the tools you have to access this old concept are now new and incredibly easy for you to get access to. So to frame why I think we need to be thinking about asset allocation and some of the traps that we fall into as individual investors, and I will say, I talk about individual investors, but this is the same in some cases with portfolio managers and investment advisors. We all come against, up against the same challenges and hurdles and thought processes that we need to run through and feel comfortable with. So the number one piece that I think clients come up against is over-concentration. And in Canada, this tends to happen because, Canadian, and I'm going to use Canadian banks just as an example, because we have a Canadian bank on every street and every corner within Canada, we feel an affinity toward them, we feel comfortable with them, we work with them, meaning we're likely borrowing or investing our money on one of their platforms. The point is we get overly comfortable with what the Canadian banks are. And for that reason, we have a bit of a bias and some of our portfolio and investment process may be overweighted toward the banking sector. And I think any other country that we'd be talking to or, or talking within, they would have some bias toward a particular theme or asset class or brand that they feel overly comfortable with. So trying to move away from over-concentration within a security is a thought process and what an asset allocation model can help us avoid. Uh, next, looking at not staying invested. So this is very prevalent in the last 16 months. Just thinking back to March and April of last year when markets were coming off or peeling back on the equity side, 
people become very comfortable uncomfortable with where their assets are and what we are going through as far as a thought process is when is the right time to add money to the market and unfortunately or fortunately it tends to be when we're most uncomfortable adding money to the market it's when there's neat opportunities that we can take advantage of so this is a limitation that we all have to overcome to feel comfortable feeling uncomfortable as far as when we're putting our money to work we also look at a lack of rebalancing now the reason the rebalancing piece is important is i think a great example might be tesla if tesla was a stock that you've owned the last two years three years four years it likely represents a greater portion of your portfolio than what it would have when you first invested in it and this happens in, in different segments different geographies different stocks and it, it's not uh, limited to any one category only that it's important to revisit your portfolio makeup on at least a semi-annual basis, if not uh, quarterly or then annually, to make sure that the weightings are appropriate for what your objectives are. You don't wanna find over concentration in a particular area at no fault of your own, other than you hadn't revisited what that portfolio makeup looked like, like in a certain period of time. The fourth one, and Larry does a lot of work on this, behavioral finance, letting your emotions influence what your investing process looks like. Easily said, very difficult to do, but it's important, again, to not let your emotions dictate or influence how you react to your investment process. You need a sound process that you stick to regardless of what the, the pain point or that emotional piece is. And you can see this. I mean, a great analogy is real estate. I mean, some of us have a bit of a fear of missing out um, sensation when the markets are getting away from you. Uh, or the house market uh, may feel like it's getting away and people want to get involved there. But also on the flip side, when equity markets or potentially the housing market are coming under pressure, you can find yourself in more of a panic mode. And again, it's, it's being able to deal with that emotional piece, whether it's good or bad, and making the right decision moving forward. On the next slide, we've done, I think, a very straightforward job of giving you a sense of the different risk buckets that you can buy an ETF in the asset allocation segment based on your time horizon and based on your overall risk tolerance. And you'll see the three that we've highlighted here being conservative, a balanced portfolio in the middle, and then a growth portfolio on the far right. To distinguish the three, you can see we've broken out the fixed income versus equity weighting. So the ratio between the two is gonna change based on the risk bucket that you find yourself comfortable. You'll also notice we have BMO obviously up at the top, but we've also included Vanguard and iShares. The point of this is that the bigger providers in Canada all offer something similar in the asset allocation segment. They all do a very good job. Uh, everyone's gonna deliver on what it is that we're trying to bring to your uh, portfolios and the right tools for you to be able to use. So you will see similar themes across different providers, you want to do your due diligence you want to make sure that the pricing makes sense you're going to want to make sure that uh, the tradability of that product is in line with what your objective is uh, but do know that you'll see these types of tools from uh, many different providers here in canada and the us now on the next page what we've actually done we've taken that balanced mandate on the previous page but we've now incorporated esg and for those of you that follow esg you're probably well versed in this already but what it stands for is environmental social and governance decisions as it applies to your investment process what we like about that concept is it's allowing investors to be proactive in how we influence the companies that we're investing in now bmo's got a very deep track record in this with over 30 year history of the esg uh, process and, and management style and we've been using this with institutional clients for as i suggested uh, 20 to 30 years now in North America, it's becoming more prevalent every single day. And alongside the topics or the headlines around asset allocation, ESG is equally as prevalent. So the idea here is taking that asset allocation ETF in a balanced form, but then knowing we have an ESG screen that we apply to it. So at the end of the day, if you like the concept of some of the tools we talk about, but you also love the idea of being a positive influence on what companies are doing in terms of their hiring policies, equity of pay throughout uh, different uh, sex and generational, 
this is something that you can take advantage of as well as the environment and that was probably where it would have been most thought of uh, 10 to 15 years ago is how can we have a positive influence on the environment and it does apply and fall under the ESG banner and you do have access to that uh, from BMO. And on the next slide here you're going to get a feel for what it is that we think are the most important characteristics of these types of tools. So number one we're trying to simplify investing so that anybody that has the ability to put some money to work or maybe has an online investment platform you can now get access to this type of ETF or tool at your disposal. Broad diversification. Diversification, you've probably heard this before, is really the only free part of investing. Meaning, if you wanted to diversify your overall risk profile across different sectors, different geographies, that doesn't cost you anything to be able to do that. And the asset allocation approach allows us to take on the onus for you, but you know at the end of the day, the product you're getting access to is a very well diversified product. Professionally constructed, where it's very defined as far as how we're allocating your asset at any given time. So what we love about this is you can sleep at night. You don't need to become fixated on what happened in the market today or tomorrow. We're going to stick to the rules and it's very much guided as far as what that portfolio is gonna look like at any, time, any part or any space and time. Uh, transparency, you can go on the websites and you have a very comfortable idea of what it is that we're doing underneath the hood. At any time, these ETFs typically hold six different or six individual exchange traded funds, and that's what gets you that diversified exposure across a very compelling uh, group of indices. And we're going to look at that in a couple slides from now. Liquidity is an interesting one because if you were to use a single ETF, whether you're buying it or selling it, you're only having to concern yourself with the pricing of that particular instrument or that particular ETF, rather than having to construct a portfolio with 10, 15, 20 different securities, 10, 15, 20 different ETFs, uh, some bond maybe exposure as well. Rather than having to buy and sell 15 or, or 20 different items at any given time, you can now buy one ETF, which will do all the heavy lifting for you as far as its tradeability. Lower cost, these are all incredibly well-priced tools, whether it's from us or our competitors. Most often it's less than 20 basis points uh, management fee to get into this type, of it, this type of tool and this type of investment. And this is amazing to think that five to 10 years ago, this type of product was not really accessible to an individual investor on their own. And now you can buy uh, what it is that we're highlighting today for less than 20 basis points, which is pretty stellar. As well, all-in-one cost structure, there's nothing fancy going on underneath the hood. The management fee that we post, and in the case of Vimo, that's 18 basis points, that is the management fee that you are paying. There's no additional hidden costs that you need to be aware of. One reference, and I we probably use it in a lot of our presentation decks, is that asset allocation determines over 90% of a portfolio's return over a set period of time. And the reference here is since 1991. And what we mean by that is it's that much more important to have the right weightings within different securities uh, rather than trying to time the market. Now, I get that some people want to be able to look at a particular uh, industry and, and make an aggressive call, thinking that there's some upside opportunities to generate some alpha or some upside performance. Not that that's a bad thing to do, but as the core of your portfolio, more important is staying invested, not trying to time the market and making sure that you have the right uh, portfolio construction. And that's really what that reference is intended to do. And we see it used in many different presentations from other asset managers, but it's a great item and a great, uh, well, mathematical result that you should keep in mind because it'll help commit you to stay the course and be committed to that asset allocation approach. Now, Rebalancing, and we talked about this in a couple of slides uh, earlier. What I would suggest is whether that's on a quarterly, semi annual, or annualized basis, the idea of systematically rebalancing your portfolio historically, and you can see here since 1999, will generate an additional 1% a year of total return after fees. Now, that might not sound material, but as soon as you have the compounding piece added to that 1%, appreciation or gain over a non-rebalanced portfolio, 
it starts to demonstrate or, or present a material difference between the two. And you can see we've broken it out in aggressive, moderate, or conservative. And the difference between those would be the equity versus fixed income weighting in any given time. But you can see that 1%, although it doesn't sound like much over um, the time frame 1999 to 2017, you're looking at a difference of anywhere from 10 to 15 percent uh, that's compounded over that time frame, and all of a sudden that does start to make a difference. And again, if you're trying to time the market for a six-month trade, this becomes less relevant. But if you're looking 20 years out or into retirement or your grandchildren in their are are ESPs, this is something you need to keep in mind and try to take advantage of. And you're able to do that now with these low-cost tools. When you, I mentioned a minute ago, you could go onto our website to get a better understanding for what is under the hood. This is a snapshot of exactly what is being held in any one of those asset allocation tools that we referenced earlier. So what you'll find are the big, most widely held indices broken out by one, geography, but then also based on their fixed income exposure. So I'll just highlight a couple of them to give you some sense. You can see that 28.22% of our portfolio would be weighted toward the S&P 500 at the time of this snapshot. And that would be the ZSP ETF for those of you who may have seen it before or you're not familiar with it. That's one of our index-based ETFs that you'll find within the basket. And then the black number on the far right, you can see a number of different digits. 506, and this reinforces that diversification story. That means that within the S&P 500, at that point in time, there were 506 securities held within that ETF. So that's the idea that rather than putting all your money to work and, and having single security risk applied to any one stock selection that you're doing, you can diversify it across the entire, in this case, U.S. market so that you're not overly exposed to any one name doing poorly or well. It's a nice nice performance behavior and capture of what the U.S. market is doing at any given time. The one immediately below it, the aggregate bond index, for those of you that aren't familiar with the bond market, I'm going to call this the equivalent of the TSX on the equity side here in Canada, but for the fixed income market. All it means is you're buying all the investment grade bonds available in Canada and you can see there's over 1,300 of them. So again, you're not taking unwarranted credit risk because you're diversified across over 1,000 different bonds uh, on a given day. And it's just a very clean way to participate in the fixed income market here in Canada. So I won't go through every single position here, but this is a great snapshot or an example of what you would find on our website if you wanted to get an idea of what the actual uh, asset allocation ETF was holding. Performance-wise, any one of the providers will see some upside performance versus their peers over certain periods and vice versa. So I, I'm not going to talk on this call about one being better or worse. I think they're all very compelling tools and they're all very effective in what it is that they're trying to do for our client base. I think what is important is to know that, again, this is a snapshot on our website, that you can compare different ETFs to one another. And you are comparing apples to apples. So in this particular example, we've taken our balanced fund, we've taken iShares balanced fund, and then Vanguard's, which are all priced close uh, in their overall management fee to the end client. But you can see that if you just step back and look at the performance chart there, they're all very similar to one another. So what that means to me is no company's taking unwarranted risk or trying to reach for the stars to outperform the other. What they are trying to do is stick to their core have, and provide a very compelling uh, return profile for our client base and produce the experience that clients are looking for. And I think this chart does a nice job of giving you a sense of that or reinforcing that premise. One thing we talk about with a lot of our retirees or our clients that are moving into the retirement stage of their life is how much more complex it is today to generate the same return that you would have been able to by simply buying one bond back in 1999 that was yielding, in this particular example, 9.9%. So to think about that based on what we're seeing today in the current interest rate environment, to think that you could return almost 10% 
in your portfolio by simply buying a bond is something that obviously we haven't seen, in, well, you can see based on the chart in a number of years. But the point is, in order to achieve that 10% target, if that is your target, I think it's just a great reference because a lot of us have liability matching that we need to do. And we have, an ex I mean, in terms of what we're going to be spending in cash flow on a regular basis, we need to be able to hit a certain mark. So all we've done here is we've taken what would be required to generate the same type of return that it would have in 1999, but you can see how diverse it is, meaning Canadian bonds, Canadian equities, world equities, US equities. You have to be that much more diversified and in incorporating different investment instruments to be able to achieve that same uh, return profile. And not only the return profile, but you can see based on the little matrix at the bottom there, a standard deviation in 1999 of a bond of roughly five versus in 2019, the portfolio just above it being 8.25. So the takeaway there is to generate the same type of total return, you do need to take on more risk to do it. I don't want you to take unwarranted risk to do it, but you do need to feel comfortable recognizing that buying a bond probably doesn't get you to where you need to be in today's current environment. And again, that's what's going to reinforce the allocation tools as we see them. So the slide that you'll see here, here's the thought process I want you to go through. Number one, start with the asset allocation. The beautiful part about this is that the asset allocation product does it for you. You don't need to overthink what the core of your investment is going to look like. What you do need to determine is how you're going to tweak that portfolio. And we call this, or at least I call it, core and explore, meaning your core asset investment piece doesn't change. You just continue to contribute to it month, uh, sorry, month over month, week over week, uh, as you're earning income and you're putting money to work, you just can stick really steady to that one core asset that you're using. And hopefully it, it might be an asset allocation product. But what you do around the periphery is where you can make it a little bit more interesting and, and kind of cater it or, or make it more appropriate for your particular needs. So the second piece there, determine your needs. Income, meaning you're needing more cash flow. Is it growth? Do you have a longer time horizon and you're looking to participate in more upside? Or do you want to manage volatility just so that you're able to sleep at night and you don't want to have to concern yourself with the ups and downs that the market provides? It's very subjective in terms of what that looks like, but the core and explore approach allows you to do that. The third piece, reviewing your income solutions to determine the max income. You can look at this based on the dividend and the fixed income yield that you're earning as far as the total income to you on a monthly basis. And then you can tweak the portfolio with your satellite positions. We're not here to talk about covered call products or dividend products, but obviously those would be some of the most appropriate tools that we have on our shelf to help complement that core and explore approach. And the fourth piece, uh, if max income exceeds current needs, maybe you're going to use the remaining funds to put into the allocation of growth. And again, it's not for us to tell you to do that. It depends on what it is that you're trying to achieve. If you found that the asset allocation tool was a bit more conservative than you wanted and you were comfortable taking on a little bit more risk for a higher return profile, you can easily do that by tilting in toward a sector or maybe a different geography. And I think Larry's going to spend some time on emerging markets and international markets to maybe talk or highlight uh, about some of the tools that you may not have thought about to this point. So with that, that's about 18 minutes, and I think that I've hopefully given you an introduction of what asset allocation investments are. Again, I very much appreciate you for listening in today. We are going to transfer over to Larry. Now, Larry and I in BMO, we do a lot of work together. Larry, from an educational standpoint, Q&A around investing, and Larry being one of the most widely followed investor personalities in the country. It's a pleasure working with him and having done that for a number of years now. So with that, I'd like to hand the floor over to Larry Berman. Oh, thanks very much, uh, Rob, and, and hopefully my, my audio is okay. I'm noticing my, uh, my internet signal here at home is, uh, is a little bit on the low side. So Steve, if I can ask you to pay attention here just in case uh, something happens. Um, should be able to uh, to go here. So, okay. Um, now, uh, oh boy. Okay, here we go. Um, okay, so so I've talked a lot um, in the last couple of weeks about our Pro I series. So I, I want to um, 
reiterate some of that tonight. I, I want to talk about very specifically uh, some valuation metrics and in particular the equity risk premium. So each week as we go through the this series, I'm going to bring up one of the items that we kind of look at and do a little bit of, of meat around it. Uh, tonight, uh, I'm going to also look at uh, some of the newest demographic trends and I think what it means for investing going forward. And as Rob points out from an asset allocation standpoint, um, beyond our core, where can we explore for some potential, you know, high, higher potential returns? And then we'll, we'll do a Q&A, of course. So uh, in terms of our Pro-I series, just to reiterate, and for those of you who are not familiar yet, uh, for me, it's, it's always about you know, the probability of, of markets going up and down or return on investment. And uh, we created this uh, more formal um, process that originated from work that I started doing in the early 1990s. Um, when I was uh, much more focused on fixed income and commodities than on the global equity markets uh, as I am today. So there's four measures of valuation, which I'm going to focus on tonight. Um, uh, there's business cycle, and we'll get to that probably in a couple of weeks. And then all of our technical slash tactical uh, indicators. And last week, we, we talked about volatility and as relevance uh, comes up each week, I'll, I'll, I'll go through them and, and highlight them all. But for those of you who wanna follow along, updated every Monday morning on the Berman's Call blog slash pro eyes, look for that um, uh, icon there in the top left corner, pro eyes, click on that, it'll take you right, uh, right to the, the database. So, so in terms of the um, uh, valuation side of things, so we have a summary. Uh, and when, when the bottom indicator there goes from you know, bottom where we see more opportunity to top where we wanna be more cautionary, the valuation side of equities for the most part, since around the Brexit or just pre-Brexit period, um, has started to get excessive. And you can see from looking at that, the volatility of markets has picked up since valuations have got excessive relative to, you know, after things washed out in 2008 and 9, and markets generally kind of had an up move. But, but they've got expensive in recent years. And when we've got periods of correction, those, vol those corrections have been deeper than they were historically. And when you measure volatility, um, the average correction for equity markets historically, US large caps in particular, 13.4%. That's the average drawdown when you go back 100 years and measure it. And in a recession, that average drawdown is 29%. The COVID drawdown, which triggered a global recession, was around 35% in global markets and for the S&P 500. So, you know, as valuation gets better, we have more opportunity. Your expected return relative to risk goes up considerably when the valuation part of the portfolio is favorable. And right now it's not favorable. And whether we look at traditional metrics like the PE ratio, which you guys will all know, price to earnings, you can look at it in a slightly more sophisticated way by saying, well, what's price to sales? Because we know through financial engineering, earnings can be manipulated. They can be manipulated in many different ways. Share buybacks, boost earnings per share, but revenue is revenue is revenue. The sales can't be, well, I suppose you could lie about your sales too, but, but typically that's not a financial engineering game. So that's, that, that's a big aspect of things. PE, forward PE, price to sales. Some of the more esoteric areas of valuation, one of my favorite, enterprise value to EBITDA. 
So enterprise value is the sum of all the debt that a company uses to generate its earnings, all the equity capital, including preferreds it would use, less whatever cash it might have on its balance sheet. So what is the capital at risk and what is the earnings power or free cash flow generation uh, known as EBITDA um, that is related to that capital? And so on those three metrics, the market's pretty much maxed, like we're very expensive. Where the market is not extreme, extreme, but still high relative to the last decade is this metric uh, called equity risk premium. And we'll take a, a deep dive in terms of equity risk premium, but at a high level, you, you, you're familiar with the PE. So what, what the equity risk premium does is say, well, what's the earnings of the S&P 500. So you take the PE and you, take, you say earnings divided by price. So it's the E over P, and that's called the earnings yield of the market. And then you factor that for what long-term debt, the, the what we call the risk-free rate basically. So you can use a 10-year bond, you can use a 30-year bond, you can use some proxy for the risk-free rate, okay? And when, and when you do that analysis, um, currently, the for the S and P 500, the earnings yield is 4.38. So that takes the forward PE of around 23, inverts it, and you get that yield. And so the current long bond yield is 2.42 as of today's close, basically. And if you subtract that, you get an equity risk premium of around 2%. <clears throat> The lower the equity risk premium, the higher potential multiple the markets will support. So what are the factors that drive equity risk premium? So one of the factors of risk is, is expected volatility. So when volatility realized, actual volatility or implied, falls, equity risk premiums can expand. The other factor is liquidity. And one of the biggest liquidity measures today is the Fed's QE program. So as the central bank supports the market through monetization, um, and you factor that against the supply. So one, one of the issues in equity markets is the competition from bonds. If there's a lot of debt that needs to be financed, that money's got to come from somewhere. Right. So who's going to buy the debt? Well, it could be individuals, could be insurance companies, could be banks. Right. Though that's basically it. It could be foreigners. Um, so when you factor the supply and demand aspects, that drives risk premiums as well. And if there's more supply, meaning there's more debt, there's more new issuance, the multiple is going to come down as risk premiums go up. Okay, so liquidity factors in markets, very important driver. Based on the past decade, the equity risk premium today is in the 97th percentile, very high. If we extend that to 15 years, it's still at that level. But if we go back 40 years, so basically let's go back to the early 80s when we had the high inflation of the 70s and bond yields were, were way up here. We're only in the 23rd percentile in terms of how expensive the markets are relative to the cheapness of money and the relative liquidity that central banks are providing. So that's, that's important to understand because the biggest mistake in terms of, of inflating this, what I think is a, a, an equity market bubble that we're in, is what the Fed is doing. And we heard from Jerome Powell today saying, risk on gentlemen, we are not going to think about thinking about thinking about taking the punch bowl away until things are tight again and we're pat really past this COVID. So, and they're, they're still saying right now, that's a 2024 thing. So 
we can expect them to do whatever they need to do to keep interest rates low. And that includes stepping up the purchase of bonds should bonds keep ticking higher here in terms of yield. And so we, we've got this put protection, this underwritten statement from central banks, and it's creating tremendous bubbles everywhere. So the Fed, Jerome Powell, the Fed was maybe going to talk about the extension of the SLR. I talked about that on this week's show. So the supplementary leverage ratio is something that in the Basel III banking reforms was implemented. And, the, and what that basically means is for the large, 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 large systemically risk banks, and I think in Canada, TD and Royal qualify under that banner, but it's the JP Morgans and, and those, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, those big, big banks, um, where if they own treasury bonds, they actually have to take a capital charge against them. And so there's less impetus for them to buy treasury bonds. So at the end of March, the SLR exemption expires and banks will have less uh, desire to hold treasuries. So in the last month, knowing this exemption was come, uh, is gonna expire, they started dumping bonds and bond yields started to tick higher. The question I have when we look at the supply and demand of debt, so you had 900 billion stimulus in January. US government just signed into legislation another 1.9. 2.8 trillion of stimulus on top of what was going to be a 1.1 trillion dollar deficit just on the regular budget. So you've got near 4 trillion of new debt this year on a 20 trillion dollar economy. You've got 20% of new debt that you've got to finance this year. The Fed is buying 80 billion of treasuries a month and of mortgage backs 40 billion. So they're only buying a trillion of that 4 trillion. Who's going to buy the rest? Well, if banks have no incentive to buy it, that's a problem. If foreign central banks on average, Bank of Japan, China, where we have the US has, has trade deficits uh, with and they have a natural flow of US dollars, well, if they recycle those dollars and don't buy treasuries with them, that's pressure against the US dollar. And who's going to buy that debt? So at some point here, the Fed is going to have to step up QE or bond yields are going to explode higher. And if bond yields explode higher, stocks are going to have a problem. So the Fed is going to have to be there through a, a, some sort of yield curve control. Right now, based on what Powell told us today, they've chosen to talk about it. So they're using the language. If the bond market doesn't hold here and yields start creeping up and the 10 year starts getting close to 2%, they're not gonna have a choice, but to basically double down on QE and buy probably closer to $2 trillion in debt. Next week, next month, three months from now, I don't know but that is coming with almost certainty. Or they believe the Fed and bond yields rally from here. One way or the other, we're gonna get some kind of catalyst that is gonna be wildly bullish for equity risk premium until they have to actually start funding those bonds. So when Janet Yellen took over in January after Biden administration got inaugurated, First thing she did was say, wow, the treasury general account is 1.9 trillion. So we're not gonna fund that 900 billion. We're gonna let the treasury general account run down and not until we need more are we gonna. So starting in June, June, July, August, September is when the bulk of that 4 trillion is gonna have to be funded of which the Fed isn't going to be able to buy enough. So that's that's what we're dealing with here. And so the next pocket of big risk for the markets is not now, it's not reopening, it's not when the Fed's providing 
a greater liquidity than supply, but it's when that supply starts to suck money out of other assets. And unless the Fed steps on the pedal, the equity markets have a problem. So that's what we're facing the next couple of quarters here, guys. Um, and so I just wanted to, to talk about equity risk premium, what it means for markets. And in the short run, there's enough room here where we could see stocks maybe 5% higher before we start to get into some valuation problems again. Uh, so S and P 500, say 41, 4200, then we start to, and that might be the high of the year. There's very good scenario here where the highs we see in the S and P for the next couple months are the highs we see this year, and that outcome is going to depend on what the what the Fed does. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about demographics and asset allocation and and where the growth is gonna come from. Because right now, all the growth, everyone's upping their growth target. Well, if the Fed just, if the US government just is spending almost $1.9 trillion over the next fiscal year, and 1.1 is gonna be spent between now and October, <laughs> this, this, this uh, fiscal, this, fiscal uh, year for the US, then we're going to get, what, and that and that actually $1.1 trillion is a little over 5.5% of GDP. So that money is going to get injected into the economy. That automatically creates growth. So companies are going to say earnings start middle of April. They're going to say, hey, thumbs up. Things are good. People are buying. We're reopening. That could be bullish for a couple months here. Okay. All right, let's get into the demographics because I'm not talking about the next couple months. I'm now talking about not only the next couple of years, but the next couple of decades. And while when we look at a target date of 2100, that's only going to matter to kids born today, your grandchildren's, you know, are you putting away for money for your kids and stuff? So, what are demographic trends drive aggregate? demand okay and, and and where the money's being spent who spends it how it gets spent are important and when you look at where things were a few years ago this is the most recent study i could find in depth of all the countries in the world i want to point out that by the end of this century china that has 1.4 billion people today is expected to have 732 million people the population of China will be cut in half. Think about what that means for growth. Your natural rate of growth in an economy is the amount of people earning income, so your labor force, plus their productivity, their output per unit of labor. That, that's GDP. So if your population is shrinking, your incomes are shrinking, that's a problem for growth. Look at the U.S. The U.S. today, it's going to be about the same. That number in Canada will be bigger, but the growth, almost 100% of it, is coming from immigration, and it's coming from other places in the world. Now, for the next decade or two, we're, we're still okay, and I'll show you some charts there. But look at the places in the world where the growth is going to come from in terms of population. A place like Egypt that's now going to be in the top 10 in terms of global population. Ethiopia. Pakistan is there now, but is going to get bigger. Nigeria, that one is key. 200 million people today, 800 million people by the end of this century. Why? The average woman's having five children. Where in the developed world and China, having less than two. So man and woman get together, they have less than two, you're, you're losing out. <laughs> you're not reproducing at a faster rate. And in the long run, that's bad for demographics. Roll back the clock till after World War II, and the average woman in America was having close to four kids. Very different world today in terms of demographics. India. 
average age of the population in India is in their early 20s. In the developed world, North America, China, Germany, Japan, average woman is close to 40. Average woman at 40 doesn't have any more kids. That's the world where demographics matter hugely. I can't emphasize this enough. I put a link to the study. The study in The Lancet, which is a health related uh, journal, is more focused on disease and things like that. But the demographic part of the study is, is fascinating. Here's a graphic. So look at the world today in terms of population, and you can see the 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 you know the 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 bulk of people are still, you know, in, if you if you take the numbers, um, about the average age of of is 35 to 40 North America, but the world is 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 around mid 30s world. Look at what they project the population to look like by the end of the century, assuming that women all of a sudden don't start having more kids. And, and that's a big assumption, no doubt about it. But if the trends maintain with what we've seen in the last number of decades, and there's no reason to believe that with incomes and, and stress to make ends meet, that this is going to improve anytime soon, <laughs> that the world is aging rapidly. And so investing in things and regions that are going to benefit from the demographic moves going forward are super important. Uh, David Rosenberg actually today, coincidentally enough, put out a study, and I, and I read it through this afternoon, and I clipped a couple charts and threw it in here because he talks about the dependency ratio. Now, what that is, is the amount of people who are below working age, so call it 15 and under, and above working age, so call that 65 and over, but, may, but maybe that extends to 70 at some point, are dependent largely because those people need their parents to support them, and the people retired may need their kids to support them, and social benefits for healthcare and everything else when they're not in their earnings years, their income generating years, and they're living off their savings. Okay, so that's really key here. So, so look at what they, they are today relative to what Rosenberg projects these to be based on some of the studies done by uh, the UN and some other, some other areas. And the, the dependency ratio is going to get worse and worse and worse. Not everywhere. Mexico is actually going to get better. India is going to get better. Why? Because the average Mexican is in their early 20s, still having more than average number of kids. And so their demographics improve. These are all really important understandings. Because when you look at this graphic in terms of population, this is not factoring in immigration. Okay. This is just based on expectations of current trends. There could be, I, I, I doubt it, but there could be 100 million people in Canada by 2100 if we allow a million people in a year. Right now, it's a couple hundred thousand. So, so those numbers matter. Now, do we let older people in or do we let kids... Uh, younger families in of child rearing age and growth and so forth. So those are all kinds of things. I'm not speaking to those at all. For the next uh, 20, 30 years, the, the mass population growth, sub-Saharan Africa, by far, is going to have the biggest, and that's Nigeria is, is one of the places, Kenya, those kind of uh, places and parts of Southeast Asia and the Middle East, okay? But, but the one-child policy in China was catastrophic for their growth out in the future because they, they've had on average one kid and, and they have an imbalance between men and women in China. Uh, I'm not gonna get into why, but, but they have 53% males and 47% females. So based on 1.4 billion people today, that 6% difference 
just do, do the math on that. It's like 75 million people in balance. So 75 million men have to leave China to find a spouse in the traditional sense, or 75 million women need to move to China to pair up. Again, I'm talking traditional, not, not anything different. So demographics matter, but look what's gonna happen in terms of developed Western Europe, North America. Our populations are gonna peak in the next couple of decades and then start to turn down. The demographics are terrible. So we need, if you want growth, natural growth, you need to look to emerging markets. There's no other way to do it. So I'm gonna spend the next 20 minutes or so digging in to tell you how I look at emerging markets. Now I have tools that you guys don't have, but some of the ETF provider sites where these ETFs are listed have a lot of this detail. You just gotta go do the work. I use my Bloomberg terminal, but you can find these. So when you buy a broad ETF, EEM, that's what this ETF is that we're looking at. And I'm comparing it here to what I call the benchmark, the US market, the S&P 500. So it's EEM versus SPY, portfolio benchmark. So when you're investing in emerging markets, you have a big weight in technology, well, a lot of that comes from China. You have a bigger weight in banks and financials. You have a bigger weight in consumers. Very interesting when you think about that. You have a equal weight approximately in telecom. You have a much bigger weight in materials, mining type stocks. You have about an equal weight in consumer staples food basically, um, and you have a bigger weight in energy. Healthcare, way bigger in the US because the US is the only country in the world that doesn't have public support for hospitals, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, so that's a big area. So outside of pharma, which is big in Europe. So if you look at that healthcare and you look, there's no hospitals, there's no HMOs, that is all US, right? That, that hospital side of things. Industrials, bigger in the US. Real estate about the same, utilities about the same. So the big differentiators when you're investing internationally are consumer uh, and financials. And so th that from that perspective, important learning. When we look at the, the dividend yield, you get a slightly higher yield um, internationally, emerging markets than you do in the US. For, from a Canadian perspective, if you get a dividend that comes from outside of Canada, it's treated as income, so it doesn't really matter. Better dividends, generally speaking, in emerging markets than in the US. When you look at the country exposure, okay, so we're looking at by country of risk. In the EEM basket, China, 38%. Taiwan, which in 10 or 20 years might be part of China. That, that's another issue that we'll get to one day because that's uh, a big thing that's, that's building. South Korea in, in the MSCI universe is called an emerging market. In the, in, in the FTSE universe, it's a developed market. It's, it's graduated into EFI. EFI stands for Europe, Australasia, and the Far East developed markets. So depending on what ETF you're using, if you're using the Vanguard version of emerging markets, South Korea is part of EFI. It's not part of emerging markets. So if you're comparing EEM to VWO and say, hey, VWO is doing better, I should buy that one. The big difference is the outperformance recently of South Korea, which is dominated by Samsung, semiconductors, et cetera, um, that have been doing better of late. So it's not their ETF is better. You have to understand that part about EEM uh, international markets as well. Then you've got India, which is a big piece, Brazil, which is a big piece. And then you have a lot of smaller areas 
collectively add up to quite a bit, but independently are pretty small. When you think about energy, you, you think about Russia, Gazprom and their gas. You think of Saudi Arabia now with Aramco public, okay? Uh, you think of um, Brazil, Petrobras. I actually just bought Petrobras stock a couple of weeks back. It was, it was dirt cheap. Um, but you don't think about China. There's a little bit in China, but compared to some of the other weights, not, not big in, in terms of PetroChina. When we look at valuation, so what I've done here is I've, I've gone back a number of years. Um, MXEF is the MSCI EEM index. And so on my Bloomberg terminal, I can look at what the analysts say about the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of stocks in that index and what they estimate. So what Bloomberg calls the best estimate PE, which means what do the analysts say? Not, not the highest, but, but it's the Bloomberg estimate best, what it stands for. Uh, and that is the average earnings per share divided by price gives you the PE. And what we see in emerging markets is that emerging market stocks are currently trading with a 16 multiple. That's higher than the 10 to 15 range. So emerging markets had been trading with a discount for a long time to the US. And the US market now is trading at 23, 24, 25 times forward earnings, crazy multiples. So when you think about a value, where's the value in the world? It's in emerging markets. Now, international developed markets like Europe are cheap too, similar type PE, except they've got major growth problems. Now, China's got growth problems too, but not for another decade or so before their population starts to shrink. Um, but China's got to manage the economy. So that, that's something to keep in mind too. So not only is there growth, but there's value two things that I like to look for. So what has emerging markets done relative to the world? Relative strength, relative analysis to me is really important. VT, the Vanguard Total World ETF. Every stock in the world, one stop shopping. I talk about that ETL. That ETF is my comparison to the world. So what I do is I take EEM, BMO's version of it is ZEM. I like to to, to use different ETFs to, sh to show you the differences. ZEM divided by VT over since 2014, since they came out with ZEM. Today, relative to the world, is as cheap as it's ever been. Now, that's on a relative basis. So you've got relative value that's compelling. On an absolute basis, that ETF is near its high. Right, so the difference between relative risk and absolute risk. So this goes to what Rob was talking about in, in asset allocation. You know, where if you were rebalancing your portfolio today, you would want to increase emerging markets relative to the more expensive parts of the world. Okay, so so that that that's a pretty important. Uh, learning, I think. So absolute and relative, pretty key concept. Okay, so let's now dig deep and, and look at how I look at some of these countries. I look for, you know, what am I, what am I owning? Don't, don't just go buy the ETF because Larry says buy it. Okay, don't, don't ever do that. Know what you're buying, know why you're buying it, Know if something goes wrong, do you need to reduce your exposure or when can you add to it? When you're investing globally, outside of Canada, Canada's 3% of the world, biggest risk is currency. The markets tend to be very correlated. The world goes, they all kind of go up and down together at different rates. The outperformance comes when yours is rising faster than the other one, right? And that's the yellow line. That's the relative performance. So the Nigerian ETF came out a few years ago. 
as you can see on an absolute basis, it's gone down in price. It was going up in 2017, but it's gone down. The components of that return for a Canadian, because this only exists in the US, what is the return between the Canadian dollar and the US dollar? And what is the return between the US dollar and the Nigerian currency? Okay. The Nigerian currency is called the Naira. Okay. So I have it in the top chart here. Now, go back and look. These emerging market currencies and these developing market currencies, specifically in sub Saharan Africa, are subject to radical currency risk and devaluation. 2016. We had the oil shock, 2015 to oil, Nigeria's biggest revenue source, okay? So after that, they had to devalue their currency and it went from 200 to looks like 300. So a 50% plus devaluation overnight. Stress builds the current and they just, the central bank just needs to let it go. So those are some of the big risks when you're owning these. And when you're buying that NGE, what you're owning right now, the biggest weight is the cement company. So as Nigeria builds roads and bridges and, and housing, cement's a big winner. That company, just buy it and put it away for your grandkids, except you can't buy it. You, you, got, you, gotta, you gotta buy it on the Nigerian exchange, <laughs> right? So the ETF is for most people is gonna be the way to play this. And and so it's got it's got a little cash in it. This one you can see it's got Nigerian spot currency. It's 12, 12, 13 percent there, 12 percent. You've got a bunch of banks. You've got Nestle. So you've got the chocolate company. I assume they're consumer products in general, but Nestle's Nigeria, another bank. You've got the telco. So you've got the wireless, Nigeria Communications. You've got FNB Holdings, so that's um, uh, holdings are typically real estate companies in these foreign markets. You've got flour mills, right? So you've got food, you've got the wheat, um, the bread company. You've got another holding company, it's probably a financial. Um, I'm not sure what Lafarge is. You've got a refinery for sugar. You got another bank. And then you got the beer company. Th those are the big weights, generally speaking, when you're owning Nigeria. So you think about the development of a de emerging market, you're not going to see a lot of consumer here, right? You're you're just not because the big companies are the ones developing the banks, you know, the the food, that kind of thing. So that's what you're going to be buying when you're buying these. And the question is, do you want to own this today in your portfolio? It, because Nigeria is going to be growing tremendously. So you got to have a framework for uh, evaluating some of the risks, what's inflation, what's, what's going on with Burk, Burk Faso and, and the, the rebels and, and the militants and, and that part of Nigeria, that the unspeakable parts of, of parts of the world. <laughs> um, so all those things are factors. I'm, I'm not saying the right answer for you. I don't own this today, but guys, it's on my radar. It's on my radar. Now I want to likely wait we, we just had a bit of a currency devaluation this year. You can see the currency went from about 375 to just over four. So I want to assess that risk. Um, and usually after devaluation, that's when you want to step in for a year or two. You, you've got a window there. Um, so that's, that's Nigeria. Brazil. Brazil, much more developed. They've got political problems. Their leader is, is up for re-election. He's corrupt. Everyone's corrupt in, 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 in that regime. Uh, Lula is going to run again. I think he's in prison still. He ran last time while he was in prison. Anyways, <laughs> Brazil has its problems, but it's a major big economy of emerging markets. The Brazilian Ria, Ria uh, real in, in, in English terms, um, devaluing again, 
last number of years. Now, big stress, Brazilian exports, energy markets, and the decline of energy as a world commodity is going to be a negative influence on Brazil, for sure. But the world's still going to need lots of oil. And Brazil is going to be a big supplier to China um, and, and probably India um, for decades to come in terms of, of their oil reserves. Um, and so recently, I've added to Brazil in my portfolios uh, directly. And in our stock-based portfolios, um, I bought the beer company, the Ambev. Um, I bought a um, green energy company um, that has a US ADR, EIGBY, I think it might be the ticker, and uh, Petrobras recently. And the Brazilian real got to its weakest level in years um, in, in the last couple of weeks. Brazil, a few hours ago, raised their overnight rates because there's some inflation stress there, uh, 75 basis points. So those are the things you need to think about um, you know, for Brazil. You've got a lot of political risk, but right now, relative to the world, there's a trade here. Now, that yellow line, when it goes from 80 to 100, that's 20% outperformance compared to what I'm comparing it against, in this case, EEM, the broad emerging markets. So I think I can pick up 20% relative gain, which was lost from December to March. Now, part of that loss was a weakening currency. The Brazilian Bria uh, went from 5 to 5.75, right? So 15% of that was currency which I think we get back as oil prices recover and we get close to the election and there's some stability. So, so I, I like to trade on currency. I like it on what's in the index, a lot of energy, a lot of mining, a lot of steel. Um, and so it makes sense. So I'm adding it right now. Pakistan, when we looked at our list of top 10 countries, now, who in their right mind would put a nickel in Pakistan? When, when you think about the political risk, when you think about the regional risk, all kinds of, but when you look at Pakistan stock, the biggest company by weight, it's the cement company, just like Nigeria. Then you got a bunch of banks, then you've got some oil and gas in that, there's the oil and gas in that region. Um, and then you've got some development. You, you've you've got um, uh, you've got fertilizer there. You, you, so 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 you see what you have there. <laughs> um, and and so you really have to look through the ETF to know what you're owning when you run. And the question is, do you want to own that? Well, the biggest risk in Pakistan is is the the regional. It's the currency. Look at in the last 20 years what the currency has done. So the Pakistani currency is a rupee, just like the Indian rupee. And, and when you look at it, it was at 50 to the US dollar, and it's now 150. And the question is, what is gonna cause the next evaluation? When we look at this graph right in the middle, what I've done here is I've taken the, uh, the repo, the financing rates for their bonds, and uh, looking at them out to 20 years. And you can see where the bonds are in terms of yield. Who wouldn't love a 10-year bond yielding 10.5%? Except you have the currency risk. And in Pakistan, inflation's running at about 8%. So you can expect with inflation in, in North America, call it two or three, and in this part of the world, eight, you can expect about a 5% depreciation in the currency uh, over the next uh, year or so. So do you wanna own Pakistan today, given that it's got energy exposure and it's got development exposure in terms of real estate, cement company, and so forth, and banks? So the answer is, is probably okay. So there might be a trade here. I'm not saying get married to Pakistan by any stretch of the imagination, but maybe there's a trade. 
I haven't done it yet because I'm not clear in my mind. But this is the process I got, and I go through all of them. Here's another one that today is not in the top 20 countries in the world by size, but will be in the top 10, you know, decades down the road. What do you get when you buy Egypt? Well, you get a lot of real estate. So there's a lot of development and growth. You get a lot of bank, right? You get financial holding companies and banks. And then you get sent them in. You get the cement company. <laughs> and then you get the steel company. And you, you get the Kuwait Holdings, which is a uh, state-owned, partially state-owned um, um, rights mining and, and that kind of thing. So, so you know, you, you, you get um, that type of exposure. And is that right for the current market environment? And I, I would argue, yes, it is. So, again, not one I've added today. Got to evaluate the political risk. The currency started depreciating aggressively. So we had a move in the early 2000s of a major move in currency depreciation. It was stable for a decade. You can see the, um, the Egyptian pound stable for a decade. And then when the Arab Spring hit in 2012, 2012, I think it was, that was the first uptick there. And it's been depreciating ever since. And then a few years ago, more political uncertainty, coups and 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 then more uncertain. So again, those risks are a big, big part of, of evaluating emerging markets. Again, I haven't stepped into this one yet, but it's on my radar. Okay, a little bit on bonds in emerging markets. There's two ways to play the debt of emerging markets. A lot of emerging market countries will issue debt, but they have to issue it in US dollars because nobody wants to lend them the money in their own currency, because when you do that, you assume the currency risk yourself. One of the ETFs that I've used and talked about for a number of years now um, is EMLC, Emerging Market Local Currency Bonds. So when they fund in US dollars, they get to pay lower coupons because they assume the currency risk. When they issue debt in their own currency, you get a higher coupon because the currency risk is on the guy who buys the bond. So those are two differentiating factors between a ZEF. So the ZEF is a BMO emerging market bond that holds US dollar debt, but it's got a currency hedge, Canada to US. It's not hedging the emerging market currencies, it's hedging Canada to US. So you're getting a pure emerging market bond exposure, or do you play it with EMLC? There's another ETF in Canada like EMLC that uh, McKenzie ETFs has, and I don't remember the ticker, I apologize, um, that plays local emerging market currencies and trades in Toronto. Um, and you can look that up on the uh, McKenzie website. When, so the, the different, China, generally speaking, doesn't need to issue US dollar debt. They're good. <laughs> so they issue local currency debt for the most part. Indonesia, Mexico, Brazil, so forth. Mexico needs to issue a lot of US dollar debt and some of these other areas that issue. Now, Saudi Arabia does that because uh, they basically has to do with the oil trade with the US. Um, and same with UAE and so forth, Turkey and, and so forth. So, so all these countries generally tend to um, uh, issue in their own debt, but will issue some pieces of US debt as well. But it's all about the currency risk. So when you look at a chart like this, the difference in returns, because you're getting more yield in the local currency for the past decade has largely been the strength of the US dollar vis-a-vis -vis some of these emerging market currencies, okay? Final chart here. This shows you EMLC on the top, the spread between EMLC 
and the broad U.S. bond market. So the middle chart is the interest rate, the additional interest rate you get by owning EMLC over and above the broad U.S. Treasury market or government market, the AGG, the entire U.S. market. Right now, a little under 3% pickup in yield. At the extreme, it was over 5% extra yield. The difference in returns between the yield swing, the credit risk, is the currency risk. And you can see that what we see at the bottom here is the, is the uh, Asian, basically the emerging market currency basket. And you can see that it's been in decline for a number of years. Now, the question is, with the US now fiscally irresponsible, printing all this paper and now monetizing debt. Relative to the, a lot of these emerging markets that have much better growth profiles, they have challenges with COVID for sure, but much better growth profiles than the US does, frankly. Are we now going to see more money flowing into these markets, which would mean that you could gain on the currency side? So those are some of the things to think about in your deep dive into currencies and whether you're looking at emerging market equity exposure or emerging market debt exposure. And, and that will conclude the um, educational part. Now, last week I showed you about these uh, learning how to hedge and these ETFs that have hedges embedded in them, right? You have a degree of per put protection and you, have a and you sell a call to pay for the put. So it's called a collared put spread. We do these in our portfolios for clients. We now have the ability to do a limited degree within the BMO universe of funds we run. The innovator line of ETFs that I introduced you to last week for the US market now has an EEM version. So you can buy EGEN. There's another one coming out soon, E-April. Um, so next month will be another issue. But the January one was issued a year ago. And I'm showing you, if you buy EEM, which you own, you got 15% protection and a 8 or 10% cap where the covered call is. Look at the performance of EGEN going down when markets were bad last year relative to owning EEM. And then look what EEM did coming back. So when Rob talks about asset allocation, these are two ETFs you could use doing asset allocation in emerging markets. When you're more concerned and you want protection, buy something like the EGEN so that if markets go bad, you don't go down as much. But after it goes down significantly, you get out of it and you buy the EEM and you get all the upside coming back. That's asset allocation, folks. It's going from using a balanced fund type version of EEM to using a full on, I want the risk. I would argue right now, <laughs> you, know, you don't want to be full on risk and you might want to look at if you're going to be in emerging markets, owning some with these buffers in them. Okay. Got about uh, 12 minutes left for q and I went a little bit long tonight, so let me see if I can get through all of these. Um, a number of blue chip uh, dividend paying RSP, and overall I've been very happy with the results. Small, I mean, can I recommend some ETFs to fill the blanks for both long-term holdings and some shorter term areas in the next one to two years? Um, international small and mid cap prospects there there's not any basically in canada you, you have to look at the u.s market um, and there's a number of of etfs that are small and mid cap international um you know i i can just bring up a uh, a bloomberg screen here and type small cap international ETF and I've got GWX, I've got small cap value, I've got international small cap equity and so forth. So 
you got to go to an ETF screener uh, in the US, ETF.com. Go there, screen for what you're looking for. They have a lot of great information on that website. Um, and I don't have a lot of tickers off the top of my head. So, so hopefully that um, answers the, your, your question there. Donna. Ruthie says, I'm keen on ZPay. Can I explain how the income is generated, option derivatives, why the volatility in the stock month to month, et cetera? Okay, so BMO creates a universe of stocks that they want to own using quality factor. That's basically what they do. So they cut down the S&P 500, uh, the NASDAQ, into probably about 100 securities in the US. And they say, which ones do we want to own today? And they buy those. And to generate the extra yield, they write a call. And they write a call on half the portfolio so that if it goes up, they're earning extra yield, but they don't give up all the upside. But for the, the ones that they don't own, but want to own, not, not necessarily here, 5, 10, 15, 20% lower, they sell a put. And they take the premium on the put as income. So the target is to generate 6% from the covered call portion and from the put writing portion. And on average, be long with a covered call, half the portfolio, and writing puts to buy the other half. Now, as the markets go up and down over time, without knowing when, doesn't matter, the more it goes down, the more they get put stocks. So as it goes down, they're getting longer, buying low. As it goes up, they're getting called away, selling high. So I've branded this or nicknamed it the buy low, sell high ETF that's going to always get you 5 6% yield with, on average, half the risk of owning the U.S. equity market. If that makes sense to you, Ruthie, use it. I use it as a core part of my holding in my uh, global dividend uh, fund. The US is spending 1.9 trillion um, and the spin is to help financing. So now I'm not a super whiz, but with 330 million population, if half get four, then that's only about 250 billion. Um, okay, so so that's so that's right. So there's about 400 billion going towards the $1,400 checks for people earning under $75,000 individual, 150 household. Um, there's extra child support, so if you have children under a certain age, you get an, you get a bit more, and an extension of unemployment benefits for people suffering from COVID. That all together, I think is about eight to 900 billion. There's a couple hundred billion for states to help funding their funding gaps. There's 100 billion ish for schools. There's a bunch of pork in it because there's always pork in a bill. <laughs> so Paul, there's, there, there's always pork. <laughs> um, and, and Biden wanted to do this. He wanted to come out of the gate big. There was a lot of narrative around you know, oh, you know, you, the vaccines, are, we're going to do our best. And, and now that they passed the bill, full on, we're doing better. It's even, they, they wanted to kickstart this thing and go. And not only that, for the next decade, they want to put people back to work. So this big infrastructure bill, greening the world, carbon neutral, all that, three to five trillion is, is kind of where the Democrats are at. The Republicans want stimulus by way of infrastructure too, and they're in the one to two billion range, but all funded by tax hikes and, and that kind of thing, uh, but not corporate tax hikes. <laughs> so, you know, they're, 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 how, do, how are they gonna pay for this? And my guess is they, they're not gonna be able to do this through reconciliation. So this bill got, got done through reconciliation which basically means because the Democrats control the White House, Congress, and the Senate, they could pass it with 50 plus one in the Senate, which they did. But if they lose Manchin and they lose a couple of the other moderate senators that are in 
heavy Republican states that have re-election risk in 2022, <laughs> uh, then they're not going to be able to do reconciliation. So that's what I'm hearing from my policy peeps uh, out of Washington. It's going to have to be, so it's going to be a scaled down bill. There's going to have to be some tax hikes. They're going to roll back partial, not all of Trump's tax cuts. Although guys like, um, who's a good example here? Well, Mitch McConnell said, no, we're, we're not going to do that. But Marco Rubio has come out and said, I'm going to support tax hikes for the wealthy. Like there, there's a lot going on here that related to re-election risks and, and so forth um, that will come into play as this really starts getting debated. Now, again, budget year, new budget year, reconciliation, if they go that route and try to force it, minimum is November. Budget year, October has to go into next budget's year. They're not, because it's got to be linked to a budget. Reconciliation process must be linked to a budget because it's not a law per se. So it must be tied to financing. That's really important to understand about the reconciliation process. With rising yield, does Zed pay a good investment? Please explain how this would benefit. Has nothing to do with interest rates at all, except for how interest rates impact equity market risk. More volatility in equity market, sure, Zed Pay is going to be more volatile. It may be less volatile than bonds <laughs> or the equivalent volatility of, say, a 10 year bond in an inflationary environment with rising interest rates. We're going to lose money. And you're not getting six, you're going to get two <laughs> or one and a half on that bond. So, Hetty, uh, um, hopefully that gives you some thought there. Frank is is saying during the past year there was such a disconnect between Wall Street and Main Street. I was so I was wondering what type of correlation is there between the stock market and the real economy? It seems the smart stock market does what it wants regardless. The stock market did what it did because of the extraordinary debt that was added in governments all around the world and the central banks that monetized the vast majority of that debt. Make no mistake that if they didn't do that, the stock markets wouldn't be here. Don't know where they would be, but they would be lower to a heck of a lot lower. And so the, the governments are always going to do that. And my fear, as this moral hazard grows, is they're never, ever, ever going to be able to balance the books. Why? Because of what I talked about at the outset, and that is the demographics. The, the, the cost of, of social benefits for the aging population, for healthcare, for social security, for things that, that might be coming to green the world, all of that catastrophically expensive relative to the tax base. And as that population shrinks, that workforce shrinks, the amount of tax it's a problem. They're going to have to start to tax wealth. I hate to say it as a fiscal conservative, but governments have grossly mismanaged the fiscal purse. And we're going to have to pay. We're going to have to pay by way of higher taxes in the future. Absolutely certain. So there'll be a reckoning around that at some point next year, the year after. Whenever the central banks and the governments feel they can pull back, that's when the stock markets are going to have a lot of anxiety, not a little bit of volatility, but a lot of anxiety again. Please comment on the outlook for the Canadian dollar. Um, right now, the Canadian dollar is so gung-ho backed on the energy story that almost nothing else matters. And and uh, I, I'm not sure, but, but technically, uh, uh, 122. Uh, you know, so so 82 cents, um, and if that 117, you know, 85 cents. So it's all going to depend over the next six to 12 months what energy prices do. That's going to be a big, and then what the Bank of Canada ultimately says. So last week the Bank of Canada spoke. Don't care. Didn't talk about currency being too strong. When the central bank sends that message, 
that's when the currency markets. But until they do, currency markets just keep pushing and pushing and pushing. So that that's kind of the short run uh, on the Canadian dollar. With many international ETFs uh, uh, on U.S. stock exchange, is there a way to hedge back to Canadian dollars? There are a lot of Canadian listed uh, that that will hedge, but if you're buying on the U.S. exchange, the answer is no. Now, in my client portfolios. I put them in a fund and I hedge the funds currency exposure. So I can do that, Paul. Individual investors don't have that luxury, unfortunately. If it trades in the US, you got to deal with the US dollar. Irene is saying she's confused about ZPayU. Um, I thought it would be better to purchase when the Canadian dollar. So ZPayU is going up more than ZPay because you're holding it in US dollars. But ZPayU has US dollars in it, but when they price the NAV, it's in Canadian dollars. So, so that you're, you're getting that currency impact showing up in ZPay. It's in ZPayU, but if your US dollar account doesn't show that currency impact. But if you bought ZPayU with US dollars when it was at 135 and we're at 125, you lost 10 points of currency there, all right? Like 8%, 7%. So Irene, it's it's there. And then uh, last question here for James, another uh, <laughs> Zed pay, I'm looking at T, return of capital. So it, it's um, partially, so Zed pay was launched uh, 20, when was Zed pay launched? Beginning of last year. When an ETF grows rapidly, as ZPay did, there's an element of return on capital. But but make no mistake, it's it's earning that yield. And I would defer that question to BMO. In fact, James, um, and, and I'll I'll say to Steve, get me that email. I'm gonna flip it to BMO and I'm gonna have BMO respond to you on that line 42 return of capital question on your T3. James, it's a very important question, um, but it has to do last year with the new ETF and the growth of the ETF and how they maintain that monthly distribution. It's a little complicated. There, there's no, there's no um, you know, bad, bad intention there. It just has to do with uh, the ETF being relatively new. Folks, we're out of time tonight. Thank you so much. Please, 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 if you can, support one of our partner companies. If you can donate to one of our charities, cancer and leukemia research in particular at SickKids Hospital or dementia and Alzheimer's work at the world-renowned Baycrest Center here in Toronto, we'd be grateful and we will match your donations dollar for dollar. Thank you so much, folks. Next week, back to Thursday nights. Have a great week, everyone. Be safe.